So welcome everyone to the last lecture, the last part of the last lecture of our product line course. And in this part, I would like to give you a brief recap of all the different topics that we talked about, but also how, how are they connected. So overall, we talked about ad hoc approaches to variability. We talked about how to model and implement features. And we talked about quality assurance. And in, the, in this very lecture, we also talked about evolution and maintenance. So the vision that we uh, tried to accomplish with this whole course was the vision of a software product line. We have mass customization, mass customization as a combination of mass production of customization. We want to have the, the positive effects of both. We want to have uh, goods that are individualized, that are customized to the particular needs, but at the same price as mass uh, production. And in the end, while this is the vision, it's of course that every variability that we introduce gives some further costs. Uh, but still, we want to have the cost, we want to reduce the cost as much, as much as possible and uh, have advantage of the benefits. We looked at car configuration and we've seen uh, with this example also that car configuration is not always that easy and straightforward. Um, and then we were rather looking into the production, but not into the production of actual hardware, but rather the production of software product lines. So what is a software product line? A software product line is a set of software intensive systems. So this term uh, it was used in order to reflect that we are looking at systems that do have a, a, yeah, a significant uh, component that is related to software. So most software product lines are probably only software systems, but there are also systems like robots, like cars that are software intensive in a way that we do have some hardware involved, but uh, the process of development more or less is uh, focused on software or most of the innovation happens there. There are other terms for this like products or variants. The central part was that we have a common and managed set of features. This means we do have a feature model. We have a feature model in which we model all those features. We are aware what are the features of our product line. We make a decision which features are in scope or which are not in scope what is known as domain scoping and happens during domain analysis. And we want to satisfy the needs of a particular market segment or mission, meaning that we do have a domain in mind. So we do have a domain for which this product line is developed and for which we uh, yeah, uh, kind of want to uh, provide a benefit opposed to uh, not having the product line. And then uh, we develop these uh, product lines in a structured way from core assets from uh, with planned and structured reuse, meaning that uh, we are developing some parts and those parts can later on be connected. And we've seen different implementation techniques with different levels of uh, planning, with different levels of structured reuse uh, from ad hoc to structured reuse. Uh, so uh, the most ad hoc is probably clone and own, where we just copy the system and make our changes, which is, according to that definition, not a product line technique. Um, and on the other hand, we have plugins where we need to foresee all the possible uh, changes to the system by means of possible extension points. This, so this is where the planning uh, is uh, yeah, kind of at the highest possible standard. So we looked at product line engineering and the promises are we produce tailor-made products, we have reduced costs, improved quality, we have reduced time to market. And we see with lectures uh, like the lecture on product line testing that improved quality can be achieved because we there's no need to test every possible configuration, but by means of pairwise interaction testing, for instance, we can find many of the problems in the software with a reduced cost, uh, but still uh, get uh, improved quality uh, potentially. And all this uh, breaks down to uh, like, uh, we want to be more efficient than single system development. And when it comes to this diagram, we can think of clone and own as being uh, what's happening with single systems. And 
For product lines, we actually looked at many different techniques uh, that are available. But before we go into those again, uh, we looked at feature modeling. So we looked at how to specify what are the features available in a product line, how to specify what are the features I want to focus on, uh, I want to implement in my product line. And we are already doing this ideally before we start the implementation. So we need to somehow identify all the features. We need to get them together in like a structured way. And we also think about the possible combinations because some combinations are not useful from the domain. But we've also seen in the course and the lecture on feature interaction that sometimes there's a dependency from, from the solution space, from the implementation that we bring back up to the domain level uh, because it's yeah, it was the the way to cope with the feature interaction was basically to forbid some of the possible combinations. So when modeling those features, we are talking about the problem space. We are talking about this is the the uh, product line or a view of the product line from the problem point of view. So we're looking at this problem. So what are the problems that we are solving? What are the features that we are addressing? What are the requirements uh, uh, yeah, connected to those uh, features? What are the features requested by a certain customer, for instance. So we have a selection of features on application level, but we also have the feature modeling, the domain analysis um, on the domain engineering perspective. And then on the other hand, we have solution space where we develop reusable artifacts. And in application engineering, we try to re make uh, advantage of this reuse as much as possible. And the, the whole development uh, in product lines is typically split into more or less two phases that are, have lots of connections between uh, each other. Uh, in domain engineering, we have everything that uh, looks at like the requirements, the design, the implementation, the testing, always from a product line view. And application engineering, where we do about the same, but only for a particular configuration. And even though uh, it depends a bit on the implementation technique, uh, how much effort is spent into which of these phases, we still we always have some application engineering. At least we need to make a selection of the features that we want to have. So we looked at different implementation techniques, uh, and I won't go into detail again now in this uh, in this lecture. So what are the uh, what are the parts uh, that we looked at? Um, we looked at runtime variability, clone and own build systems and preprocessors, both as a means for conditional compilation. We looked at components and services, uh, frameworks as plugins, but also feature modules and aspects. And all those techniques, I mean, there's basically no perfect technique. Um, there are techniques that provide compile time variability. There are techniques that provide us the, the option to uh, implement features or to generate products automatically or to enable feature traceability. But even though like feature modules and aspects do have a yes in every column, there are potential further columns. Uh, for instance, we want to have interfaces between the features because we want to like give one of the features uh, to some to another co uh, company that uh, we, uh, yeah, kind of want to uh, let the company develop uh, that feature. And this is not, not feasible with feature modules or aspects, for instance, because there are no interfaces. So there are further properties. And there's basically no technique that is perfect with respect to uh, every of, uh, of those properties. And for every case, in uh, like in the implementation, it's always a decision which technique to use and which technique is better than other techniques. And this might also change during development. So it might that we start with clone and own because we only have two products. Then we have three products. Then we have four products. And when we reach 10 or 20 products, then we have maintenance problems and uh, decide to go to more structured reuse technique. We not only looked at different implementation techniques that are kind of orthogonal to each other. So we can uh, choose one of those. We can also combine them. But we also looked at design patterns and how design patterns can help us 
uh, in our yeah, structure in the design of software product lines. Um, and we've seen that like the static combination that we have with object orientation uh, easily reaches uh, limitations uh, and faces problems. Uh, so we looked at there are cases where design patterns can help and design patterns can basically use with every of the other implementation technique to improve the situation, but only design patterns themselves and object-oriented programming do not solve all the problems that we have. So we need some additional technique to take care of the variability. And then in this course, we looked at uh, implementing features and uh, like the implementation and where does it happen? We're actually seeing that most of the changes are actually happening at the implementation level, but still there are frequent changes also to the feature model, to the uh, variability uh, that is made available. And this is in contrast to like the idea of domain engineering, application engineering, where we start the domain engineering, we do our domain analysis, and then we never need to go there again. We see that this is a, a frequent and iterative process in which we going back and forth. So if we find problems in design or implementation, we are going back to domain analysis. We change the feature model and then we uh, go uh, back again, or we have some configurations that do not work well. So we are forbidding some configurations or we are re-implementing something. And often, like in 4% of the cases, we are also changing the uh, feature model uh, in uh, term uh, in changes of Linux. And then we looked at uh, quality assurance of uh, features. So features are interacting with each other. We can visualize this, uh, at least for some of the systems. Uh, tools are available that can do this, that can see what is the interaction on data? What is the interaction on control flow? Uh, because this kind of gives us like an estimate what is the, the largest possible degree of an interaction that we can expect from a system? Because if I'm uh, having a problem in the source code over here at that very position, then it's likely that uh, I will yeah, uh, face uh, a higher order interaction interaction of more than two features. And we can make use of this when analyzing features. We looked at static analysis of um, variability, the product-based strategy. We simply generate products and can use off-the-shelf tools to analyze these products. For instance, if I have a Java product line and I can generate Java programs given the particular configurations and then analyze these Java programs, for instance, compile them. Uh, then we have the feature-based strategies. So we analyze or try to analyze individual features. This can be done, for instance, when we come to uh, when it comes to plugins for a framework. So we can analyze uh, a plugin uh, to some extent in isolation, and then we have to look at the family-based strategy: how to find and detect type errors, how to, how to detect certain uh, kinds of dead code uh, without the need to generate particular uh, configurations or products of the product line. And then not everything can be detected by means of static analysis. Uh, so we also looked at uh, dynamic analysis of testing. And there, the yeah, uh, most research technique and also becoming more and more popular in practice is that of pairwise coverage. We have pairwise interaction testing where we try to cover every pair of features. Uh, so in order to make sure that we have some coverage of the uh, configuration space. And this goes back to uh, the, like, uh, the knowledge that higher order interactions are much more seldom than pairwise or one-wise interactions. And uh, we can find those uh, by means of uh, a small subset of the configuration space by looking, for instance, in this example, only at six configurations. And then once we detected feature interactions, uh, for instance, by means of static uh, analysis or by means of uh, testing, sampling, for instance, uh, then we need to deal with those interactions. And we looked at different strategies, like changing the feature model, changing the implementation in different ways, making features orthogonal that were not orthogonal before, or uh, duplicate parts of the implementation, moving some source code to other features, 
or some techniques that are specific to certain implementation techniques like using conditional compilation or creating additional uh, derivative modules. So overall in this course, we were looking at how to implement features and also how to implement variability because the ad hoc approaches that we looked at are not really considered as techniques for implementing features, but rather like techniques uh, like clone and own for implementing variability. We looked at valid combinations of features, how to model what are the features of a product line, what are the possible uh, valid combinations of those features that we want to support. We're doing this during the main analysis, and then we want to implement those uh, features and how to do quality assurance. What are feature interactions? Why are feature interactions especially a problem for product lines? Uh, and how can we detect uh, static, uh, feature interactions statically and dynamically, but also how we can cope with those interactions? And, but only in brackets over here, uh, because we only looked at this very uh, briefly in this lecture, how do product lines evolve? How can we maintain a product line over time? So for literature, I'm referring to earlier parts uh, of the lecture. And yeah, if you have any questions, any feedback, uh, just get in contact with me or my collaborators, Elias Küter and Timo Kehrer. I would like to thank both again. It was a great collaboration on the slides so far. And I'm looking forward to many discussions on how to improve the course also in the future. Um, and if you have any feedback, uh, we are planning to have new revisions of the course uh, uh, every year or uh, as we uh, give the course again. And we're also planning to have some more uh, and new videos uh, depending on the extent of changes later on. Uh, but of course, if you have something, if you want to contribute to this course, if you found some problems, we are very much looking forward to your feedback. Uh, and also if you have some new pointers for things that we should talk about in the future. Many thanks for taking uh, this course and uh, hope to see you again in one of uh, the other courses. And uh, yeah, thanks for watching. Bye.